Um, as many of you know, one of my goals in creating the dinner party, a symbolic history of women in Western civilization, now permanently housed at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum, was to overcome the erasure that has repeatedly eclipsed women's achievements. A contemporary illustration of this erasure is the story recently told by the writer Sue Monk Kidd of visiting the dinner party and discovering the Grimke sisters of South Carolina, which is where Kidd is from. Although they were legends during their lifetimes as the first abolitionist to publicly speak and write about female equality, she had never heard of them. As she writes in the author's note at the end of The Invention of Wings, her best-selling novel about the Grimkes, how could I not have heard of them? My ignorance felt like both a personal failing and a confirmation of Chicago's view that women's achievements had been repeatedly erased throughout history. The reason I cite this issue of erasure is that it helps to explain why in 1999, after a 25-year absence, I returned to teaching. By then, I had been receiving letters from female students at numerous universities and art institutions all over the world. They reported that they were learning almost nothing about women's history or women's art. In fact, many of their art professors, both male and female, were hostile to female-centered work or unable to adequately critique it. As a result, they felt unsupported or entirely stranded in terms of their artistic growth. Moreover, most of them were unaware of the feminist art movement of the 1970s, which is now noted for having dramatically affected art practice. Between 1999 and 2005, I took a series of semester-long appointments at a variety of universities around the country first by myself and then in tandem with my husband, photographer Donald Woodman, who's standing right there. Actually, um, the first year, the first two years, let's see, the first year when I taught at IU Bloomington, I took, we have a bevy of cats, and I took the cats, I had the cats. And then the second year when I was at Duke, Donald kept the cats. So that was not exactly great for us. So then we decided we better team teach so we could both have the cats. <laughs> anyway, as I said, at IU Bloomington, Duke, and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, I was alone. Then Donald and I team taught at Western Uni Kentucky University in Bowling Green in a public-private partnership with Cal Poly Pomona in California. And finally, thanks to Constance Gee at, at Vanderbilt. In addition to hoping that I might be able to offer something valuable to students, my decades-long experiences as a practicing artist and the pedagogical methods that I had begun developing in the 1970s, I thought that my pedagogy might also prove empowering and again, and perhaps not only to women. I was also interested in discovering what had happened to university studio art education during my long absence and to record what I learned in Institutional Time, a book that took me 10 years to write. Could I have the next, Donald? In the first chapter of the book, I review my early feminist art programs in <coughs> Fresno and then at CalArts, where working with our students, the artist Miriam Shapiro and I created Woman House. As the, these programs have been widely dis discussed, I don't want to spend a lot of time on them, except to say that when I brought my Fresno program to CalArts, along with a number of my students, including Nancy Yodelman, who's been here on campus, I did not understand how markedly different it was from the emphasis of the rest of the art department. In fact, this period at CalArts marked the beginning of a significant change in university studio art education, as can be surmised from a quote from Paul Bar Brock's 2007 obituary in the LA Times. Paul, who was Mimi's husband, was the dean of the art school at CalArts, and he was the one who brought the feminist art program into the school, providing us with our own studio space, a materials budget, and the first position for a feminist art historian, not to mention the first time that any university 
uh, uh, art program provided a, an educational opportunity specifically for women. Even though Paul supported the program, apparently his own views were that, quote, art school is less about teaching how to make art than about learning what it means to be an artist. Well, you could have fooled me. My idea of studio art education was to help students find their own voice by d discovering their personal content, then expressing that through appropriate media, which was the emphasis of the feminist art program. The important distinction here is that I stress the importance of content along with developing the skills to express it clearly and effectively. But I left academia soon thereafter in order to concentrate on studio work, so I really didn't understand the significance of the shift introduced by Paul until I returned to teaching. One of my first encounters with the consequences of this change was reading Howard Singerman's book, Art Subjects, which include, by the way, there's very little uh, literature on university studio art education, so shockingly little. Art Subjects was one of the few books there is. It includes the quote with which I actually introduce my book. Although I hold a Master of Fine Arts degree in sculpture, I do not have the traditional skills of the sculptor. I cannot carve or cast or weld or model in clay. Why not? Could I have the next? I will now briefly discuss my various teaching skill stints and then share, oh, actually I need the next one, Donald. This is Woman House. Yeah, thanks. And then share some of my conclusions that parallel something that Stephen Henry Maddow pointed out in a recent book, one of the few on, our, on studio art education. It's called Art School, Propositions for the 21st Century. And in that book he wrote, quote, current and new students are paying fortunes for inadequate art educations and getting into bank loan debt, which is a huge disservice to them, a subject to which I will return. When I went back to teaching, I was particularly interested in addressing the gap between art school and art practice. Many art students find this transition difficult, but it seems to be especially challenging for women since many of them have little or no idea how to generate the money, space, or time necessary to set up a life as a professional artist. Consequently, at most of the universities where I and then Donald and I taught, I instituted a project class that would allow students to experience the different stages of professional art practice, from identifying personal subject matter and formulating images to mounting an exhibition. My hope was that by traversing the gamut of difficulties between creation and exhibition, the participants might become better prepared for the rigors of professional life. At IU Bloomington, I had hoped that some men would sign up for the class as I was eager to discover if my pedagogy would be useful to them, a subject to which I will also return. That didn't happen until I taught a graduate seminar at uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. The images you see are just a few from the wildly successful exhibition that was the result of the IU project class, which was held at the IMP Design University Art Museum. The title was based, Sensation, was based on the Brooklyn Museum Sensation Show, which was up at that same time. The participants' work was wide-ranging and included this hilarious parody by Peg Brand of a de Kooning woman painting <laughs> in which people could insert their heads and be photographed, <laughs> thereby replacing his vicious, objectified form with a laughing, grinning image of female agency. By the way, Peg, who like Constance, was married to the head, Constance, when I met her, was married to the uh, Chancellor of Vanderbilt. Peg was married to the head of the IU school system. And Peg, like Constance, had started out as an, in the art department. 
Also like Constance, she had ended up feeling, in her case, she ended up in philosophy of art, Constance ended up in art education. In both cases, they felt completely unsupported in their graduate programs as artists. Anyway, as part of the exhibition, there were a series of performances, some based on woman house skits and others written by the students. The more recent pieces were extremely illuminating in terms of the issues being faced by young women there. When I was at IU in the 1990s, post-feminism was all the rage, especially in the art world, which was loudly proclaiming that feminist art was passe, assuming a world where the gains of feminism were unequivocal and its goals roundly met. But my students' performances told a very different story. One that expressed their confusion about the fact that they were being encouraged to believe that they could do and be what they wished. However, their life experiences were contradicting this rosy view. I myself always thought that this idea of post-feminism was ridiculous, <laughs> especially given the conditions of many women in the world. As the editors of Bitch Magazine once suggested, we will live in a post-feminist world when we achieve a state of post-patriarchy, a goal that is nowhere near being achieved, at least not in large parts of the world. Try telling the women in Afghanistan we live in a post-feminist world. Anyway, until that time, of which I think will eventually come, but not in our lifetime, I believe it would be a lot better for young women if they weren't fed such a big lie, which is the title of the chapter that deals with IU. Could I have the next? Some of the consequences of this fiction about how <coughs> everything's changed now were brought home to me at, of all places, Duke, which is a stellar university, at least for the male students. When I was there, the school was led by Nan Cajon, an avowed feminist. Late in her tenure, she undertook an initiative aimed at examining the situation of women on campus. Of course, if she'd asked me, I could have given her an earful. As I describe in Chapter 4 in Institutional Time, my Duke class was structured to lead students through three of the subjects that I had explored, women's history, birth, and the Holocaust. At that time, Duke's art department was small and could not provide a studio space. Moreover, most of my students were not majoring in art, so I assumed that they would mostly do text-based projects. As it turned out, most of them wanted to create visual works, which meant that I had to stand on a desk in the classroom in order to look at their pieces. <laughs> that was not a lot of that. It was really a great way to do crits. Anyway, early on, I encountered the fact that the female students, my female students, and they were in the majority, were so preoccupied with what was happening to them on campus that they seemed unable to concentrate on the subject matter of the course. During our group discussions, they complained about being viewed as objects by the male students, being judged by their looks rather than their intellectual abilities, and being dismissed when they tried to express their ideas in class. Some of the students mentioned that when they first arrived at the school, their pictures were placed in little black books that were circulated among the male students who competed for the triumph of being the first one to get them. Consequently, they dampened themselves down, as one student put it. Having these discussions with my Duke students, which I could not believe, caused me to experience an intense sense of deja vu. It was almost like being back in the early 1970s with the <coughs> Fresno girls. That's what I used to call my students, They're, who are all now in their 50s and 60s. They go, Judy, we're in our 50s and our 60s. And I'm like, yeah, but they'll always be girls to me. Anyway, the stories I was hearing from the Duke girls were all too familiar. Identity confusion, destroyed hopes, eroded self-esteem. But how could this be? This was Duke in 2001, where there was a strong women's studies department and a feminist president. What there was not, however, was a transformed curriculum. As I point out in the book, when women were finally brought into higher education, no thought whatsoever seems to have been given to the fact that they were going to be introduced to an entirely male-centered curriculum. As a result, as the pioneering women's historian Gerda Lerner points out 
in the creation of feminist consciousness. If you haven't read, I would highly recommend. <coughs> Men develop ideas and systems of explanation by absorbing past knowledge and critiquing and superseding it. Women, ignorant of their own history, do not know what women before them thought and taught, and I would add, <coughs> created. So generation after generation, women struggle for insights others already had before them, <coughs> resulting in the constant reinventing of the wheel. The renowned art educator, Elliot Eisner, often spoke about the null curriculum. The idea that what teach schools do not teach may be as important as what they do. Sitting in classes that focus on men's achievement with a, women, a few women thrown in, coupled with the negative ways in which they were being treated, called into question for my Duke students and many female students everywhere, the institutional and societal stance about female equality. I'm going to read that again. Sitting in classes that focus on men's achievements with a few women thrown in, coupled with the negative ways in which they were being treated, called into question for my students the institutional and societal stance about female equality. It was confusing, and confused students cannot concentrate. They are physically present, but intellectually absent. absent or they engage in an intense inner struggle, seemingly exercising their minds while wrestling with these crucial issues. As a result, the personal tends to overpower all other concerns. This situation places immense pressure on women to accept the patriarchal status quo, even if it means that, as Gerda Lerner pointed out, they have to act against their own best interests. Charlotte Templin writes in the male-dominated curriculum in English that it is by a process of complex social dynamics that the tastes and preferences of males have been institutionalized in the university to the point where even most women unquestionably accept them. This same situation is present in art. As I often say, there's the big art history and the little women's art, even though for a long time female artists have been a major presence in the art world, a history that I outline in chapter two of the book where I also discuss that studio art curriculum is inherently biased against women, though perhaps not intentionally. Rather, it is one manifestation of the fact that few studio art professors, female as well as male, are educated in women's history and women's art. As a result, they are often unequipped to adequately deal with female-centered art, which in contrast to my own experience in art school, young women are now free to create. I'm gonna get off the subject for one more minute to give you, and then go back to the Duke class, to give you an example of what I mean by uh, the inherent prejudice against women in the curriculum. When Donald and I were living in Santa Fe, a friend of ours who taught at the Santa Fe uh, Art Institute, which is now the Santa Fe University for Art and Design, asked me to do a critique for one of his students. I walked into the student's small studio, because she said he, she was floundering. I walked into the student's small studio and looked at her work, which was a series of eviscerated torsos. Very painful. I looked at them for a few minutes and I said to her, tell me about how you were molested. Whereupon she burst into tears and she said, all they said to me in my art school critiques is it might be better to hang these from an I-beam. In other words, her professors could not read the content of her work. Why could I? Because I'm versed in women's art history. I've looked at the work of hundreds of women. I've worked with hundreds of women whose subject matter often focuses on molestation, abuse, confusion about sexuality, their own 
And so I was able to identify the content in her work. The fact that none of her professors, even the well our well-meaning friend who asked me to look at her work, could not identify, critique, or help her transform this subject matter into effective art is, an ind is a manifestation of inherent bias in studio univer university studio art education curriculum and it, how it leaves fem female students in particular stranded. Although I would learn when I began to have men in my class that it also leaves stranded men who have subject matter that falls outside of the parameters of contemporary art. Okay, now back to the Duke class. Judy, what? Before you continue, I don't think the sound system in the room is on. No. Back there. You can't hear me? No. How can we get the sound system really? tech in this setup? Because I know the video is picking up, but there's no sound in the room. You're not hearing me? Huh? Why didn't somebody say something before about this? I don't know what I have. I just have, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a technical. Yeah, okay. You have to understand how completely. Just keep talking. How completely both surprising and in some ways heartwarming this is because for so many decades people told me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any questions while we're waiting? Might as well use the time. Yeah, who are you? <laughs> yeah. What do you do? Um, I'm an, actually a theater artist. Okay. And my question was about this young woman. You said that she did not have a good mentor, good someone to help her with the art. So in other words, there could have been more to be done with that piece that she was working oh. on, but no one knew how to help her? Absolutely. I mean, one of the problems with the work was that, you know, is, is that it was too raw. It was oh, too no. crude. Mm -hmm. And she, because her professors could not, did not understand what she was trying to do in the first place. In the first place, yeah. they could not help her transform it into art. Okay? Yeah. So, I mean, who wants to look at a bunch of eviscerated torsos, right? I mean, you know, there's ways of dealing with hot subject matter that make helps you, ter and, and since I've worked with so much hot subject matter in my life, you know, birth and the Holocaust, and, you know, I mean, I have personal experience as an artist. But also, I have this knowledge base of how other women, look at Frida Kahlo, for example, talk about transforming hot subject matter, okay? So, on top of the fact that they, the, the university professors didn't have that knowledge, there were not courses in the history of feminist art. There were not, it wasn't part of the mainstream curriculum. Even now, I mean, like a lot of the young women who've been interviewing me and, you know, in relationship to this celebration of, of my getting to be an old lady, you know, they who have come through, you know, a change in consciousness, they still talk about they have to seek out this information. Mm -hmm. And as I've been saying, I don't see why we, have, we should study men and men don't have to study us. I mean, what kind of unfairness is that? Oh, now I'm going to have two of these things. Yep. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so where was it? Okay. Um, oh, I know. I was about to tell you how smart the Duke students are. They really are smart. And once, I mean, what I had to do was provide them with some access to feminist theory. Because after all, now there's decades of feminist theory that could help them put the experiences they were having to do into a historic context. Because most of them had come through high schools, either all girl, you know, Duke's a privileged school. They'd come through either all girl high schools or uh, like very, very, uh, you know, small private schools 
where this thing about post-feminism was like, oh yeah, well you can go out there now, you can do and be what you want, blah, blah, blah. They get to do, they, you know, since we live in a post-feminist era, why study feminist theory, why have women's history? So they had no context to understand that what they were experiencing, I mean, it seems remarkable, right? But it was true. They had no context to be able to it, it understand that what they were experiencing, of course, had to do with their gender and the fact that Duke was still a highly male-centered school. In fact, when that whole scandal erupted around the lacrosse team, I mean, it was not really that big a surprise having been at Duke. Okay. Um, okay, now I have to come back to her. Okay. Uh, before I continue, the, the Duke show also had a huge impact. They did a show at the end of the semester. The administration was so impressed by the fact that it was so interdisciplinary and it, it, the students had produced, I mean, these were undergraduate students it, it, working without studio space. Most of them were working in their dorm rooms. They just had, they really wanted to make art. So the school, uh, the show was just supposed to be for the weekend. But the school actually decided, the administration decided to keep it open for the duration of the semester in, uh, in across after the school break because they wanted like everybody to have an access to see it. And before I go on, I just want to venture an explanation about why the student shows like at IU, Duke, and the rest of the places we've taught had so much impact. To again quote Stephen Henry Madoff, the contemporary art for art's sake stance has generated a fear of narrative content that is not serving us well in the 21st century. Modernism defined universalism partly through form, devoid of social content. But this has become a repetitive formula, an armor without a body, ultimately decorative. Earlier I mentioned the discrepancy between my early feminist art programs and the direction in which art school education was heading, a direction that definitely privileges form over content and learning how to act like an artist rather than learning how to make art. Hence, the lack of skill training outlined by Howard Singerman. The quote I gave about how he has an MFA in sculpture, but he can't make sculpture. He can only talk about being an artist. <laughs> And he came from one of the better schools in Cal Southern California. He never would quite say whether it was Cal Arts or UCLA, but obviously from what he said, well, how he described it, it was one of the best art schools in the country. Okay, could I have the next? At the same time as my class at Duke, I also did a graduate seminar at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Half of the students were males, which provided the first real opportunity to discover whether my pedagogical methods could be applied to more than the occasional fellow. There were a couple guys in the, in the two classes. I was also curious to see what impact their presence would have on class dynamics. Over the last 30 years, the subject of men in a feminist environment has been vigorously debated. That's an understatement. <laughs> The consensus is that when men are present, they tend to dominate the class. Despite the fact that my circle-based pedagogy counters this tendency, there was a time when I was convinced that if men were present, women could not be themselves. When I want returned to teaching, I wanted to test this premise. And in chapter five, I discussed what happened in the UNC class which I don't have time to go into now. Suffice it to say that a number of my male students benefited from my approach, especially in the next teaching project I did at Western Kentucky University, which I did with Donald, uh, it was called At Home, and it revisited the subject of the home 30 years after Woman House, this time with both male and female students. And I think you all know that there was an exhibition in the Special Collections Library of all of the teaching projects, along with a, a, a whole video installation of, of the various projects and te my teaching, our teaching, 
Um, again, the issue of erasure, along with Gerda Lerner's point about repetition, became extremely relevant in the At Home Project because the women, unschooled in the history of the feminist art <coughs> movement, reiterated many of the same concerns already expressed in Woman House. In contrast, it was some of the male work that was startling, notably the subjects of male rape by a woman and murderous sibling rivalry, some of the subjects that men took up were I had never actually seen direct expressed in art. To further emphasize some of the deleterious effects of the null curriculum, in this case for men, I want to mention that while writing Institutional Time, I read a book called Against the Tide by Michael Kimmel and Thomas Mossmiller, which is a fascinating history of men who supported women's struggles for equality. The authors mentioned how surprised they were to discover over a thousand documents indicating men's active participation in the suffrage movement. Like, I didn't know there were 30 or 40, 30 or 40 men in Seneca Falls. I never read that. <laughs> the reason for the exclusion of this information from our standard histories is certainly worth pondering. Perhaps it does not serve the cause of male dominance to publicize the many eminent men who have challenged this continuation. An unfortunate consequence of this silence is that men who find themselves uncomfortable with the lack of gender equity in the world are also deprived of role models. Could I have the next? In chapter six, I deal with both the at home project and envisioning the future, a public private partnership that was supported by Cal Poly Pomona and the Pomona Arts Colony, which you probably don't know what that is. It's a collection of galleries, nonprofit arts organization, artists, and institutions in and around downtown Pomona, which is about 40 miles east of LA, and it's called the Inland Empire. The Pomona project involved almost 80 participants, but this time, instead of working directly with them, Donald and I attempted to train facilitators, each of whom led a group composed of both students and practicing artists, an approach that I used dating back to Woman House. In fact, one of them, the facilitators, is here today. Bill, are you here? Where are you? Bill Catlin was the facilitator of the sculpture uh, group in Envisioning the Future. And he then became the director, the head of the art department at Azusa Pacific, where he was teaching. And in the 10 years since Envisioning the Future, he's been working on transforming the curriculum of the art department, which he's going to talk about tomorrow. I'm very excited to hear him talk about that, because of course it's part of this whole thing that's happening here, which is how to take my pedagogical methods and make them available. And Bill's going to talk about how he adapted them. Anyway, while most of the facilitators, but there were eight of them, were able to adapt our pedagogy, several of them stumbled at the point at which they had to provide content-based critiques, or crits, as they are called. As everybody knows who has ever gone through studio art education, they are an essential part of that process. The failure of the facilitators was due in large part to the fact that Donald and I did not realize what a problem this point was going to be for some of them. Because for a lot of the facilitators, the crits they had themselves experienced in school were probably focused on form or materials. And in some cases, they were brutal, the subject I take up in the book. Any of you see, what was the name of that? Oh, I forgot the name of that movie. Oh, Art School Confidential. Did any of you see the film Art School Confidential? Yes. You know how people said, oh, they didn't understand why there was a murder in there? I'm like, what do you mean that you didn't understand? So the point of the movie was that art school crits can be murderous, right? They can murder you, literally, particularly at Yale, as I understand. Although it both envisioning the future and at home brought some unpleasant 
surprises, <coughs> mainly centering on the uneasy, often uneasy relationship between art and academia. From what we've heard since about envisioning the future, many lives were changed. And some really interesting art was made that wouldn't have happened without the project. As to at home, uh, John Oakes, a former faculty member at Western Kentucky, organized a traveling show titled At Home on Tour, which went to several venues. And the project lives on in some of the scholarship it has engendered and the fact that now, like all my teaching projects, it's archived in the Special Collections Library here at Penn State. And the model that John did, the 112th model at, that John created of the At Home Project, is in the Special Collections exhibition. Can I have the next? Our last teaching project was at Vanderbilt, as I said where the Chancellor Gordon Gee was then married to Constance. Constance and I were interested, particularly interested, in trying to integrate studio art, art history, and art education more closely. In most university art departments, these are compartmentalized, as you know. In fact, when Donald and I first went to, just before we went to uh, Vanderbilt, that the art and art history department were fighting so intensely that Gordon was thinking about putting the department into receivership, <laughs> which is when the administration takes control of a department and likes, because they, they're so dysfunctional. Uh, they did have a divorce. I mean, they actually did have a, a divorce, and, which was how we got this incredible building the Cohen building, which had before they had lived there together, the art and art history department, but they left to their own quarters. And so we got this incredible 13,000 square foot building where uh, the participants worked and then we transformed into a huge uh, exhibition. Although uh, I would say our, I don't know what Comstas would say, but I would say that our success of trying to reintegrate studio art, art history, and art education might be, was maybe dubious. The exhibition itself was a huge success. In fact, today I was when in the Special Collections Library in the TV that has all the teaching projects. I'm standing there, Constance, looking at you perform your piece with the mask. Crowds of excited viewers at the opening kept saying they were, quote, blown away. And many of the student evaluations, which we shared with Gordon, stated that they had learned more in the four months with us than they had during the rest of their college life, which I actually attribute to the power of art, the potential power of art. In addition to describing the Vanderbilt Project in Chapter 7, which is titled Beyond the Diploma, I return to the subject of the often bumpy transition between art school and professional art practice. Oh, I'm sorry. This is me working with a student on her project. I was going to finish up the Vanderbilt project. She was a very t she was a very talented painter. She's actually a mathematics student, graduate student, but she had a burning desire to make art. She had very little training in art, and when what she, usually when you do paintings, you start with the background. And then you lay in the large areas of the figure, and then you do the details. But since she had never gone to art school, she started with the heads meticulously painted, floating in the space, in the canvas. And then she, of course, got herself into a great deal of difficulty trying to pull it all together. Um, how many people here are artists? Um, at this moment in time, now I'm going to go back to this thing about the transition between art school and professional art practice. At this moment in time, the sheer number of graduate students is formidable. According to gradschools.com, there are 918 graduate programs in art and fine arts in the United States alone. Between 1990 and 1995, there were over 10,000 MFA degrees awarded a number that is in no danger of diminishing. Moreover, at any given moment, 
There are 40,000 young artists walking the streets of New York looking for galleries. And there is the same number walking the streets in London. Most graduates emerge into an art world that provides very <coughs> few ways for them to earn a living. This forces many to work at full-time jobs, which leaves little time or energy for making art. In general, unless an artist comes from a wealthy family, there are only two sources of funding other than holding a full-time job. One is the gallery system, which supports but a fraction of the many artists working or wanting to work in their profession. And the only other wellspring of support is academia, where the comp competition is fierce because the quantity of candidates greatly exceeds the number of jobs. I understand that there are 700 uh, people applying for every job in, in studio art at the CAA. This situation is made even worse by tenure, which ties up positions for decades, even when the professors have ceased creating or exhibiting, which is not uncommon. <coughs> Equally com common are studio art professors who commandeer studio facilities for their own use, a situation we encountered during our years in academia. Donald, can I have the next? <coughs> These are all uh, from um, Vanderbilt. Uh, and when we were there, when we moved into the Cohen building, we had to cut the locks off three quarters of the sculpture studio, which had been commandeered by the sculpture professor for his own work. <laughs> and his students had been used as his assistants. So when I say it's common for studio art professors to commandeer studio facilities for their own use, I know whereof I speak. Or professors who really don't care about teaching, they only do it to earn money while they pursue their per personal careers. <coughs> Several students told me about one of their drawing professors who spent the entire semester in his office drawing while they were left by themselves in the studio without any guidance. Curiously, university level teaching is the only area of education where no training is required. Even kindergarten teachers have to be certified. Moreover, studio art education is in great flux with a hodgepodge of approaches, including a lot of winging it. One common problem is that there is very little on honesty about what the art world is really like. When I graduated from art school, I was able to get by on minimal resources and to work long hours in my studio. At that time, there was almost no market for contemporary art, at least not in Southern California. Today, the situation is vastly changed. As artist, curator, and educator Uta Matabar stated in, also in art school, the pressure is on the art schools and programs to connect early with the art market and generate a smooth entry into the system while young artists are still under the school's umbrella. Unfortunately, the art world has a tendency to pick up, extol, reward, and then discard young artists like so many used clothes. An unfortunate tendency because careers disintegrate before the artists have the opportunity to mature. I often rec receive requests for advice from young artists. The best response I can imagine is Fred Wilson's <coughs> eloquent answer in art school. I think MFA programs should resist the art world. Already legions of young artists come to New York to make it. The idea that this is the beginning of a lifelong journey into the mysteries of making things seems to be a back burner thought if it is thought at all. How unfortunate, how wrong. Being a nobody has its benefits. You can decide what you think about things, realize what is important to you, develop your own way of see seeing things, and then your own way of creating things. His words echo my own beliefs expressed in my studio and in my teaching that art is a process of discovery. As I've stated repeatedly, I believe that it is the duty of a student
to help their students find their personal visions and the means to express that. What I've learned from my return to academia is that my philosophy stands in direct contradiction to most university studio art programs today, which emphasize form over content, dazzling media effects over meaning, meaning and outsourcing instead of developing skills. So what's the answer? While we were still at Vanderbilt, I received a copy of an upcoming article in a K-12 through art education journal that was presumably a tribute to me and the dinner party. Although I understood that the teacher had good intention, her project, which involves students creating autobiography plates, was antithetical to my goals in that the dinner party is meant to teach women's history and to help girls move beyond the personal in order to expand their horizons. By that time, plans were underway for the dinner party's permanent housing. Reading the article convinced me that there should be some guidelines for teachers who wish to incorporate the piece into their art classes, which has happened many times over the years. Like many university-trained art artists, I had always looked down on art education. Intense dinner con conversations with Constance <laughs> at the Chancellor's residence at Vanderbilt introduced me to a new way of thinking about K-12 through art programs, which Constance argued should not focus exclusively on making art, but rather introduce children, most of whom will not become professional artists, to a wide range of possible ways of being involved in art. Of course, this is true of most undergraduate art students also. They will not become professional artists. With Constance as my guide, I ventured into what was completely unknown territory, which was K through 12 art education and curriculum development. Much to my surprise, in contrast to the paltry amount of discourse on university studio art education, K through 12 educators, I'm sure some of you know this, but I didn't, have long been involved in a comprehensive rethinking of art curriculum. Something that, in my opinion, is long overdue in terms of university studio art education. I do not have time to discuss this in any detail, except that there is a lot to be learned with some of the K, from some of the K through 12 curriculum writers who have been integrating the sensitivity to gender and diversity and promoting a content-based and broad approach to the arts. Like Marilyn Stewart, who spoke this morning, about the K-12 through dinner party curriculum that we developed. Admi admittedly, it is important to acknowledge that teaching art to children is quite different from training artists or providing a sub substantive art education to undergraduates. But in my opinion, there is an urgent need for a radical restructuring of the art and studio art programs that are now offered, which frankly are deficient dishonest and lacking in standards. In addition, we need to recognize that being an artist, even a successful one, does not automatically make you a qualified teacher. In other words, being in a Whitney Biennial does not qualify you to teach at university level. I've already argued that there needs to be a greater focus on content across the arts. In addition to helping students find their own subject matter, critique should include discussions about content as part of a more holistic approach to art. In the book, I talk about my visit to Moore College for Art, which is the only art college in America for women, and the completely, the complete lack of guidance and help those young women were getting in finding their own voices. As that, moreover, as I point out in, in the book, the overly harsh and unsupportive critiques that are prevalent today need to be acknowledged for what they are, a misguided attempt to separate out serious students from the rest, if in fact that is their intent. Given the evolving nature of contemporary art, any curriculum has to be flexible and adaptable. Certainly, it cannot be the product of one person's thinking, which is why I'm advocating a serious national or international dialogue between studio art and art history professors art educators, and art professionals of all kinds. The 1970s ushered in a dramatic change in consciousness 
regarding gender and diversity. But that change has not yet been sufficiently translated into significant institutional change. What I am calling for is a radical transformation in policy and in curriculum, one in which women's history, women's art, the feminist art movement, along with the history and cultural production of other marginalized groups, becomes fully and equitably integrated into our museums, universities, and art schools, which continue to promote a white, male-centered perspective with a few women and people of color thrown in, what Elizabeth Sackler describes as the salt and pepper approach. If such a goal seems overly ambitious, I would like to remind my audience that long ago, I set out all by myself to teach women's history through art. The dinner party's worldwide and ongoing impact demonstrates that change is possible, especially if people work together for a common purpose. I wrote Institutional Time in the hopes that there are many members of the art community who are dissatisfied with the state of university studio art education and who will come together to achieve what Bell Hooks outlined in teaching to transgress. The classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. In that field of possibility, we have the opportunity to labor for freedom, to demand of ourselves and our comrades an openness of mind and heart that allows us to face reality even as we collectively imagine ways to move beyond boundaries, to transgress. This is education, and in my opinion, art as the practice of freedom. Thank you.